evening, everyone. The topic that I'll be presenting to you today is about climate services. Um, and this is very relevant to the theme of resilience, sustainable development, disruptive times that uh, we have here today. So climate extremes um, are clearly a disruption in Jamaica. So on the screen here, I'm just having a snapshot of uh, just a few years ago, 2015, we had a drought that actually cost our economy a billion dollars. I'm not sure. So many persons might already hear about, okay, yes, Jamaica is in a drought, this and that, but do we actually recognize the how disruptive this is, not only on a macroeconomic level, but also on the household levels? Um, so we have more recent headlines about our normal, our present drought right now. But even um, to bring the point home about how disruptive climate extremes are, I just have on the screen a snapshot of um, some of the projections. So um, in terms of just drought alone, we are projected to have 21% less rainfall by the end of century um, based on a study from um, our climate studies group. Um, in terms of agriculture, uh, as a, as a subsector, which is very climate sensitive, we have one fifth of our entire population that's directly employed in agriculture. And I don't know about if anyone in this room does not eat food. So in, even though we might not be directly employed in agriculture, of course, we know how important it is um, for everyone, right? So um, social implications of these climate extremes, we have over 200,000 um, individuals registered as farmers in Jamaica, and there are several more unregistered farmers, right? Um, so in view of all of this, all right, I'm gonna be just defining the what of my presentation. So I mentioned the term climate services. I'm not sure how many of you have ever heard the term, but basically what climate services are is applied climate information to help individuals, help organizations make decisions that are climate smart. So you see on the screen five different types of people there, for example. So this first lady silhouette here is asking, should I plan a meningitis vaccination drive in my region? So this climate service can be targeting the health sector to make enable decision making. The second one, which is who we'll be focusing on now, is a farmer. So questions like, do I need to plant drought resistant seeds next season? Climate services will help farmers make more sensible decisions to reduce their losses, right? And some persons, um, we know that there is widespread distrust um, with some of our Met Office um, project, like forecasts. However, we do have enough evidence to suggest, for example, even with the 2014 drought case study, that um, with major droughts and major events, they are more likely to be correct than we, you know, our mundane things. So actually, um, there is evidence to support the push for climate services and for greater access. So why is it that um, I am bringing this up here? So in my own primary research, which I also um, performed in my doctoral thesis as well as post the doctoral thesis, I have recognized that many farmers, actually over 90% of farmers in rural areas where I studied across Clarendon, across um, St. Mary, they do not have, um, they're not aware of the existence of many of the pharma bulletins, which unfortunately they have been um, predominantly on, um, placed on internet sources. Internet, and you know, of course, connectivity is very um, you know, scarce in rural areas where the majority of farmers live. In addition to that, another barrier is limited resources on um, the part of the climate services providers. So the Met Office staff and extension officers, they are not able to do adequate community outreach to increase this awareness. So this is where TVET comes in. So I've highlighted at the bottom here. This is where that I believe that TVET holds a great potential to revolutionize climate communication within farming communities, given community trust that already exists within these commun communities towards these institutions. So further justification uh, before I go into 
um, specifically what um, I believe would be helpful um, as a role for TVET. Let me just give you a few more justifications. I have four. So in addition to shortfalls in current approaches and the slow mainstreaming of tasks in inadequate staffing, um, there is a trust and proximity factor where um, TVET institutions in Jamaica, we have at least two to three in each parish, and they're established both in urban and rural settings. They're already part of Jamaican communities, and so instead of in reinventing the wheel, having new projects to, um, you know, having that extra burden in the Met Office institutions, why don't we introduce an intermediary that already exists that also, in addition to that, has already um, programs, for example, including digital literacy that's already integrated within their um, training programs. So can we, um, I, I would propose that TVET would be a cost effective approach um, as it already has ready learning infrastructure and programs with no cost also for participants um, given the new announcement, right? It's also relevant, it's aligned with um, government's mandates, you know, to expand its community interventions. So for all of this, this presentation and this proposal sees TVET as a conduit for participatory climate services. And so the aim of this presentation is really to present a preliminary proposal of curriculum topics for a Jamaican climate information service training, vocational and education training. So instead of saying all of this, you'll be hearing me just say CISTVET. CISTVET, all right? So my three objectives here, I'm going to be applying some of the past research, not only primary research, but also with other authors that had um, done farming surveys to guide priority target populations for curriculum training with emphasis on the, the pharma sociodemographics who have been identified as being most vulnerable to losses, crop losses in past events, climate extremes. My next objective is to propose curriculum content that's based on a synthesis of feedback and analysis from both institutions. So I mentioned RADA and I also mentioned Met Office as well as pharma stakeholders. And from these, I'm looking at three things. What were seen as the enablers? So which farmers from my studies um, were more likely to be aware or have access or use climate services? So what factors characterize these groups of farmers? And what were the barriers from those that did not have access? So from all of those different models that I had, I've synthesized information to basically streamline the content that is being proposed so that that would target and hopefully increase uptake or farmers to use the climate services uh, so at the community level. And then the final objective here is to reflect on a possible way forward for curriculum piloting based on other case studies globally. All right, so now just briefly, I'm gonna be breezing through this curriculum approaches, curriculum designs. Um, we all, for those who are in education, which this is why I'm also in this setting because I do welcome um, constructive criticism regarding my approach because education is not my specialization. My specialization is more on research, all right? So I found three major um, approaches that um, had been used, I looked at past farming training curricula. So farmer training in communities is not a new phenomenon. Um, it is much, it is, it is now more widespread, but subject centered, of course, focusing on content, problem centered, focusing on the problem, learner centered, which is usually seen as the most effective, focuses on the students' needs. So. I found different curriculum designs that actually intersected with each of these, and I won't go into these details. I have I submitted the full paper. Hopefully, you'll be able to see it if you get access to that. But we, I found that the learner-centered approach continues to be used as a modern, as a dominant approach for various pharma curriculum, curricula, right? And so, based on all of this review, what I have proposed would actually take an eclectic approach. Um, Sorry, I'm not sure why it's going. Okay, good. Right, so I 
mer tried to merge the strengths of the learner-centered model, problem and subject-centered, um, but the learner-centered would take the core um, of the curriculum, right? So I would start the curriculum with a subject-centered approach with the core objective of basically rationalizing how important is climate services to farmers and at that point, introducing the core terms and concepts that they might actually encounter when they look at the pharma bulletins. Because remember, what our aim is? What is our aim in, in, in this thing? Does anyone understand what the aim is? The aim is to let the farmers, after this, use climate services. You look at these bulletins and actually um, use it in their decision making. So if they're not able to understand the terms that are being used by the Met Office, we need to introduce these terms in the curriculum, right? So after, but the core of that, after that introductory phase, we'd have that core objective of overcoming the barriers of climate service uptake. And that's where the learner-centered approach would actually be dominant to make sure that the farmer's priorities are met in an iterative process of customizing aspects of the curriculum. Right. Since the core of imparting knowledge on how to access and use climate services would remain, the core content would remain. Then the third section would be um, the area for the farmers to give their feedback on their emerging needs based on their the yeah how, how relevant they see and what problems they see emerging. All right, so I'm going to just run through the methodologies for how I... Um, where this draft curriculum has actually reached. Um, first, of course, consultations led the process, which is a bottom-up approach. Um, farmers and practitioners, then I um, looked at case studies globally, um, as I previously mentioned, of other curriculum approaches. Then I synthesized farm and practitioner priorities, and then the stage of refining the curriculum is still in process, which hopefully, at the end of this presentation, anyone interested to join, um, in collaborating and possibly having a project through this is welcome to speak with me. All right, so just to give you an overview of how or what informed the, the targets of the study, um, 487 stakeholders were consulted and these came from five different communities, Thompson Town, Moko Milk River, all in Clarendon, different agroecological zones, also had 20 persons from Bogwalk, 36 from Jeffrey Town in St. Mary. And then we, I also consulted four, well, actually more than four institutions, but I just grouped them in four categories. Um, and from this, uh, we had, all right, so the consultations performed were actually initially for technical research to actually assess assess how many farmers were accessing and being aware of climate services. So it was not initially for the curriculum, but we used, we integrated those outputs from those consultations and applied it to the curriculum content. All right, and one important or one interesting thing from of this curriculum is that we use statistical insights on socio-demographic tendencies for priorities. So uh, you'll see in some of the subsequent slides, uh, what age group, for example, and which which uh, different other categories that we saw seem to be the most needy, or uh, probably that's not the best word, but you get what I'm saying, right? Persons that are would probably most benefit then from a curriculum like this, um, since of course we have limited resources, so we, it would be good to target first so we can prioritize. Um, this is just a five-step process. Um, it's looking at just showing you that it's a bottom-up approach. Of course, as I said, the consultations from farmers, farmer feedback is driving the content of the curriculum. Okay, so back to again, um, looking at the working framework. Um, Maslow, uh, his logic sequence, you know, he spoke a lot about the cognitive, the affective, the psychomotor, um, and these different, um, what, what do we call it, modalities or learning uh, styles uh, would also fit in with, other, with the studies on awareness, which has to do with how cognitive access and the use 
of climate services. And so it, I, I actually noticed that in other curricula, like the one that's screenshot on the screen, this similar logic pattern had been basically followed. It begins with the basics, as I mentioned before, with um, defining key terms. So just letting them understand um, some foundations and then there would be uh, more of an emphasis on the more practical and system approaches. Uh, so this is basically the, uh, that was the framework. So now onto curriculum process. Target population and delivery. Okay, so as I mentioned, this is really evidence-based um, content and it's guided based on previous research done locally, of course. Um, this would have to be seen as a pilot because not every community is the same and this is being informed by specific locations. Um, however, when, I, when we see similarities across the different case studies, we can still um, apply some of the information or the general principles to other areas as well. So it's, yeah, there is still some flexibility. So what I have here on the screen is I'm going to be showing you five, six, six target areas that um, the curriculum could mostly target and which were the main differentiating factors, sociodemographic differentiating factors between the farmers who were less likely to access climate services and those who were more likely. So the first factor was educational level. So five minutes, all right. Farmers with lower, so farmers with lower formal education had lower accessibility. So we'd want our content to be focusing on more farmers with lower educational levels. More small farmers as well, because they had lower access. Farmers who are more farm dependent are also more likely to be, to have less access. So these would be more better to be targeted. Older farmers were not able to um, mix their traditional knowledge and modern climate services well based on previous studies. So they would also be a good target, but it would be good to mix the age groups for knowledge transfer. Registration status, unregistered farmers should also be included. Um, so I'll just move on because I wanted to just give skim through some of the contents in, in the interest of time. Um, there are three proposed units and of course unit one is on the foundations which basically look at relevance and awareness of the key concepts. Module two looks at maximizing enablers which really just encourages farmers to participate in activities and groups that enable access to climate services based on their priorities. The next module is reducing barriers which looks at um, for example, especially digital literacy, linking language to field understanding, and also, um, so digital literacy and reducing trust barriers, those were two major things that we'd hope this, this curriculum could help to address. And the final unit is aligning priorities to refine future CIS. So one of the things we want from this curriculum is that it will be become part of that mainstream process that you know the TVET institutions will be able to communicate back to the Met Office to say, all right, this is really now a changing need for the by the farmers. This is what they they really seem to be needing now. So can we see if we can develop new products to as address these new emerging needs? Okay, so curriculum details. Um, the first unit, of course, relevance. We see why we ask the farmers to have activities. Why is farm? Why is climate important? Because um, all of these are justified based on what we found in previous research. For example, personal perceptions of climate change was found to be an enabler of adaptive action. That just means that farmers who recognize that their, their, their surroundings were changing in terms of temperatures or rainfall patterns, they were more likely to actually try to do something to um, try and reduce their, um, their impacts. Uh, why is it not business as usual? So that's, that's another key topic part of the, the, the introduction, um, what science has, has to offer to help me. So part of this curriculum is also very culturally, um, culturally responsive. So based on the religiosity um, that we found in the rural areas, we can show that there is not necessarily a, um, a what do you call it now, like a contradiction between science and believing in God and that science is not opposed, so it's not that you can't embrace science, because that would also seem to be a, a barrier for some of the farmers to even want to consider. 
right? So things like this, having um, showing them the, the main climate products and where to access it, that would be part of the first module. Then when we move beyond the foundations, we'd be targeting five main um, components to maximize enablers, reduce barriers. So one of them is letting the farmers basically own the relevance of climate services for them. And then also to encourage them maximizing their social support systems, then also overcoming the barrier of digital literacy. So that's going to be a very big core of it, as I mentioned. Um, we could give them also an opportunity to become what the literature terms as a champion farmer as well. That is something that can be quite an exciting initiative um, because uh, farmers then can do peer to peer, um, like peer to peer influence and also in that way help to overcome some of the institutional barriers that extension officers face in the field and uh, um, also applying to their own context. So I'm not going to be able to go through all of that, but um, we just giving an, I'm just giving an overview regarding all of these. So they'll be identifying their own priority parameters, what really matters to them. So they could use things like these charts and rank what matters more to you. Is it more like rainfall? Is it, do you, do you, does the wind speed affect you more, temperature based on what you have? And then you use that as a, as a TVET instructor to guide what you prioritize in that community. And um, you'd have, of course, you'd have to have technical support from these institutions to come in and help with some of the, uh, as guest, guest lecturers, if you'd like to, to term them in that way. Um, but digital literacy, I believe already the infrastructure is there. Um, where am I at now? What does this mean to my farm? All right. Um, so, because I've already given the outline and I don't know if my five minutes are up, I believe they are, um, I will just go into the way forward and next steps. So I believe that with all of this um, and in view of projections as well as the, the present impacts and socially, um, economically, environmentally, that TVET does present a unique opportunity to um, to present efforts towards sustainable agriculture in the face of change. So as this proposal aligns to uh, aligns with national, regional, international development goals, I believe there is scope for project financing, because I, I do believe that's probably going to be a question how we're going to implement all of this. Um, but success really requires um, continuous iterations, collaborations with practitioner, practitioners already involved in climate services, as well as those involved in the education sector. And so the suggestion is that we start small, of course, and we pilot with various phases with intermittent evaluations. And any suggestions that you have and any questions, they're welcome. Thank you for listening.